Good evening, everyone. It is so wonderful to be spending another Tuesday night with uh, with such amazing um, viewers. We could not be more excited about the authors that are going to be in conversation together this evening. I have to say we booked this event several months ago and I might have screamed audibly when we got the email that we were going to be able to host it. So this event has been something that I have been super looking forward to. Uh, I know so many of you, we've received emails um, and calls about this event. Um, so I know we're going to have an incredible group this evening. Uh, group, two authors. I guess, I guess the three of us count as a group. We count as a group. Um, my name is Stephanie and I'm the director of operations for The Novel Neighbor. If you haven't heard of us before tonight, we are uh, an independent bookstore located in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, and if you're not in St. Louis, we are we ship across the U.S. Uh, so we are happy to still get you your copy. And we even ship internationally as I, we maybe have some Canadians this evening. Um, but like I said, I could not be more excited. That's why I'm rambling on because I truly uh, was just in the, the green room with these two. And I know this is going to be an incredible conversation. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, our first author uh, is Rachel Yoder, who you might recognize as the author of Night Bitch. Her debut novel, which um, released in uh, July of 2021. It has already been optioned for film by Anna Perna with Amy Adams set to star. She is a graduate of the Iowa Nonfiction Writing Program and also holds an MFA in fiction from the University of Arizona. Her writing has been awarded the Editor's Prize in Fiction by the Missouri Review and with notable distinctions in Best American Short Stories and Best American Non-Required Reading. She grew up in Mennonite community in the Appalachian foothills of Eastern Ohio, and she now lives in Iowa City, shout out to the Midwest, with her husband and son. And spoiler, I think a hamster. Uh, Miriam is our star of the evening, Miriam Taves, who you might recognize from this incredible cover book. Oh my gosh, the screen's in reverse. Fight Night. Uh, Miriam is the author of seven best-selling novels, Women Talking, All My Puny Sorrows, Summer of My Amazing Luck, a Boy of Good Breeding, A Complicated Kindness, The Flying Troutmans, and Irma Voth, and one work of nonfiction, Swing Low, A Life. She is the winner of the Governor General's Award for Fiction, the Libris Award for Fiction Book of the Year, the Rogers Writers Trust Fiction Prize, and the Writers Trust Marion Angle Timothy Finley Award. She lives in Toronto, and I think this is her eighth book as I said, seven, fight night. So I could not be more excited. Please join me in welcoming Rachel and Miriam on the screen. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Rachel. Hi, Miriam. <laughs> Very good to be here. <laughs> yeah, it's such a pleasure to be here with you. Like um, you're going to start us off by reading a little bit from your amazing new book that's I will, I will. Everything. I flip through, you know, books, they always have 400 pages before it actually starts. Uh, so I, should always, I should have a marker and that would save time. It would also save time if I didn't ramble on about all that. Okay, here, I, I will read from, yeah, from, from from Fight Night, I guess everybody knows that that's what I'm reading from. Um, uh, the book is the book is written from uh, the, the, the point of view of a, of a nine-year-old girl named Swiv. And um, she's writing a letter to her dad, her missing dad. Uh, so, she lives with her grandmother, uh, Elvira, and she lives with her mom, who is pregnant. Dear Dad, how are you? I was expelled. Have you ever heard of choice time? That's my favorite class. I do choice time at the Take Apart Center, which is the place in our classroom where we put on safety goggles and take things apart. It's a bit dangerous. The first half of the class, we take things apart, and then Madam rings a bell, which means it's the second half of the class, and we're supposed to put things back together. It doesn't make sense because it takes way longer to put things back together than take them apart. I tried to talk to mom about it and she said I should just start putting things back together sooner before madam rings the bell. But when I did that, madam told me I had to wait for the bell. I told madam about the problem with time, but she didn't like my tone, which was a lashing out tone, which I'm supposed to be working on. Mom is in her third trimester. She's cracking up. Gord is trapped inside her. I asked her what she wanted for her birthday and she said a cold IPA and a holiday. Grandma lives with us now. She has one foot in the grave. She's not afraid of anything. I asked her where you were and she said, that's the $64,000 question. She said she misses grandpa. She said that by the time she gets to heaven, he'll probably have left. Men, she said, they come and they, 
Today marks the beginning of our neo-realist period, Grandma told me this morning. She plunked down fried potatoes on the table and a bottle of ketchup. Fun and games, she said. She told me I have blue Nike swooshes under my eyes. She said I need to get more sleep. What's the problem, Swiv? Bad dreams? Okay, I'll stop, I'll stop reading there. So. That's it. <laughs> that was great. <laughs> Oh gosh, Swiv, our 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 protagonist, our lovable, precocious. Um, her voice is just like carries the book, but it starts with this letter um, to mm -hmm. someone, a, a character who is off stage, so to speak. And maybe we we can just begin there because there is a certain um, wonderful intertextuality, for lack of a better word, perhaps, mm -hmm. um, about the book, right, where there are letters that the characters are writing to each other. Um, there are assignments that the characters give each other and, they, and written assignments. Mm -hmm. um, there are stories that one character will tell to another character about a third character. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, there's a sense that among the characters, among these three women, talk is exchanged freely um, and that nothing is disallowed. And this sort of openness, as a person who also grew up Mennonite, feels very non-Mennonite uh, to me because um, there's no shame. There's like a shamelessness mm -hmm. about these women that feels really liberating um, and radical. And so I'm wondering, do you consider storytelling, um, even speaking, perhaps as a as a Mennonite woman, mm -hmm. uh, both in practice and in concept, this sort of antidote to shame? Is that how it's sort of functioning in in here? Yes, absolutely. I think there's um, I think there's a, a subversive quality to it, to telling stories, to talking, like you say, to sharing stories. I think um, you know like you growing up in a Mennonite community, I was surrounded by, well, because, you know, the men and the women and the boys and the girls, we, we had such separate lives, you know, the, 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 this was part of the, the culture. Obviously, you know, we lived together in families, but, you know, in life we were so separated and, and um, outside of our homes. And, and I think I was, I just remember being surrounded by women, relatives, aunts, cousins, you know, my sister, my mother, and, um, and just talking about so much you know just the and just the laughter and the sharing and the, and the sharing really of um you know kind of like private details you know and and you know a lot of what you might think of as indiscreet you know sharing and, <laughs> and body, body stuff you know and and um yeah and so and that was kind of uh was sort of titillating in a way it was exciting it was because it was so it seemed so forbidden you know and then when the men you know would sort of enter the room and of course not all men but you know not all men <laughs> <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> no, but but you know that that would kind of stop right and you know the women would go back to their um kind of thing you know the expectation of you know being being silent and submissive and and obedient and and that wasn't the expectation necessarily in my immediate home you know we were encouraged to to speak out and to to um you know to voice our our opinions but but um but yeah so it did have that it did have that kind of you know subversive quality and and when you talk about shame i mean that is so true and i know you know it like it's that i mean it's just it, it you know it, it's it's like being fed a constant diet of shame and again you know my mother attempted to protect me and my sister from from a lot of that but you know it gets in right in a community like that and and um it's it's such a it's such a destructive um damaging soul destroying thing yeah. and it's um and it's uh, you know and it, and it comes from from the church and from those rules and and um you know and it, it's not um it's uh it's not easy, you know, it's not easy to live with that shame, you know, just that being the sort of constant kind of, you know, way like or standard or the barometer or whatever it is of, you know, of existence when, you know, you're just sort of like permanently ashamed of things and you don't even know what, it's just that feeling, you know, yeah. it's just, I, I should be embarrassed, I'm, you know? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, I completely relate with that. And 
you know, when I when I started writing in my early 20s, it was because I the shame had sort of made me implode. Right. And I made a huge break with my community and with my family in a very dramatic fashion as 20 year olds do. Um, but I found myself literally very biblically, very alone in the desert, in the Arizona desert. Yeah. And I, that's when I started writing because I needed a story. Like I, I didn't know what my story was anymore. I had, I had lost my, I, I rejected the stories that had been the shame stories that had been given me mm -hmm. all of those stories of patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And I did, there was nothing for me to read. Like I didn't have a story about a Mennonite girl who, mm -hmm. who left home. Um, mm -hmm. And so, so storytelling and writing became very much this sort of survival tactic mm -hmm. for me. I like, go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean no. to cut you off, but absolutely exactly the same for me. And as you were talking, I was thinking, yeah, that's, that's, that's what it is. I mean, you leave a community like that. I was kicked out of my, out of the church too. And, um, and left and you're, it's the world that, you know, it's, it's everything that you know, and you know that you have to leave in order to, to be yourself. Um, and you're also being asked to leave. <laughs> so, you know, you're, you're, you're leaving a world that, you know, the world that, you know, and going into another world that's also, um, so, so foreign and, um, and it's a hard, and so, you know, you're not, you, you're, you're, you don't belong in a sense. I didn't, I felt, I felt that I didn't belong in either one. Yeah. Um, I didn't know how to navigate I, either one. It, none of it, none of it made sense. And so you're just kind of not in any world and writing, you know, came along as this thing where, you know, you could create a world, you could create a world that made sense to you, you know, that somehow tapped into all of those feelings and that weird confusion and bewilderment and alienation and loneliness, like just mm -hmm. that deep loneliness. Um, and yeah, absolutely. You know, in terms of survival, that is, it. that's, yeah, absolutely. That's what writing means to me as well. Yeah. And I mean, I guess, I guess that was, you know, I was going to ask like, why do you write like as not only as like a, an artistic question, but as sort of like a philosophical question or existential question, like mm -hmm. what is writing to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. What is writing to you? And um, yeah. writing is, I mean, it is oxygen. It's, you know, <laughs> it's food, it's drink, it's shelter, yeah. it's survival, you know, it just is. And you're, I mean, in your first two, I think it's interesting too, your first two books aren't necessarily like taking up the Mennonite, the whole Mennonite thing. Right. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm very interested in, in your evolution, sort of your relationship to your subject matter because for 25 years people have tell, been telling me I should write about being Mennonite and it's I it's like the last thing I want to write about yeah. I've tried to many I've tried to for decades and yeah. it's the hardest thing to, I don't know how to do it I think only now in midlife I'm like okay maybe now I can start to yeah. talk about it and it's it's really interesting as a writer when you can't find the words yeah. for something like there's yeah. only silence. So maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, like those first two books yeah. and moving through them and like, and then moving in into this sort of Mennonite series, yeah. for lack of a better term, or, you know, moving into this, this deeper content. Yeah, we have so much in common. Um, mm -hmm. and, and absolutely, when I started writing, um, my first book was um, kind of a fictional, you know, thing about a uh, story about, about, you know, fictionalized about my, my experiences being on welfare as a single, you know, mom on welfare. I was young and I was living in, you know, uh, pub public housing, you know, and, and um, with a group of women that I was fascinated by. And um, it was a time of um, <clears throat> sort of uh, kind of neoconservative, you know, real, um, you know, stripping of social, um, you know, programs and, and uh, um, a kind of hatred of, you know, and, and certainly discrimination against, you know, against poor people against, and particularly as always women, you know, mothers mm -hmm. on, and particularly mothers on welfare that, you know, par parasites and all of that stuff. So there was all of that welfare bashing going on. And I wanted to write in response to that. And I wanted to, I 
I had wanted to make a documentary about it, actually a radio documentary. And I was freelancing as a journalist. And then I decided, no, I would write fiction about it because as you know, you know, uh, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a deeper truth that you can get to through, through fiction. And so, um, so that was the sort of impetus of that book. And it never occurred to me that I was writing about Mennonites or that I wanted to write about Mennonites or it, I didn't even think about, I, I knew I was a Mennonite, but I mean, it wasn't, <laughs> You know, it was like I knew I was a wo woman, or I knew I was a. It was like the air you breathe. Why would you write about it? Yeah, like nothing interesting about that. Yeah, <laughs> and so you know, and um, and but yet even even so, at the at the beginning, um, I knew that my characters were. They, they felt to me that they were somehow Mennonites, like they somehow, you know, the, the father character, the parents. I mean, I was writing about Mennonites, even though I didn't know I was writing about Mennonites. Right. Um, but I wasn't writing about the Mennonite situation, you know, at least as I experienced it. And so, and then even my next book too, it wasn't, um, you know, certainly, yeah, it wasn't having to do with Mennonites at all. And was that like an active, res like, w were you actively resisting it or you were just kind of no. like? No, no, I wasn't yeah. actively yeah. Resistant, resisting it. I just think that I just didn't, I hadn't been able to understand um, my feelings. I hadn't been able to process at all my feelings about it, the, you know, the, the deep kind of whatever pain or, or, and also, you know, joy um, mm -hmm. that, that it had given me that, um, and, and the sort of uniqueness of it in a sense, I just hadn't, not, none of that. I mean, I was so thrilled to, to have left you know, I was young. I was so thrilled to not be in that community, to be, you know, a secular person, to be writing, to have gone to university, to have kids, you know, different fathers. I wasn't married. I was, you know, I was really wild, you know. That sounds fun. And, <laughs> and I had broken, you know, but, it, but in a sense, but so it, it took me a while to understand that, oh, this is a this this is a thing that's you know that 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 is inside of me and that I'm living with and all of these feelings. But a huge huge um, part of that was that my father died. Um, so my um, before um, and that was that was also when things shifted for me. Um, my dad committed suicide in 1998. I had um, written two books, that, these ones that didn't really have anything to do in my mind, at least um, not consciously with Mennonites. And then he died and that just opened up this whole kind of thing. And I knew that I hadn't wanted to write about, then, then I realized that I guess I hadn't written about Mennonites because I hadn't wanted to hurt him. I hadn't, because he was a, a devout, Mennonite, and he was um, committed to that to that community and to that lifestyle. He knew that I couldn't do it. You know, I could I couldn't be there, and that that really pained him. You know, and um, um, he he didn't shun me or anything like that. I mean, you know, we continued obviously to to, to have our relationship, but yeah. as a, as father and daughter. But it but it but it's you know. But at, when he died, I felt free to 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 examine my own feelings about that community and to write what I what I wrote, you know, which was basically began as a kind of critique of, of fundamentalism, you know, and of that culture of control and how it sort of damages and just destroys a family. Um, yeah, so um, and it, and that's that's a strange thing too, you know, to sort of reconcile that to because because of, co of course I would prefer that my father was still living, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, because he 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 died, um, it did. I I did I did feel free to write that stuff that I knew you know would have would have just hurt him. Yes, yes, I completely understand and, yeah. and resonate with that as the um, youngest daughter of a Mennonite pastor. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, you're P P K. P K. Yeah, you're a pastor's kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> was, yes, I am. And and yeah, I mean, and that's a strong voice to write uh, alongside or in the yeah. shadow of. So yeah. I mean, yeah, and, yeah. And a, you, even just a father's voice within the Mennonite culture, I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, this that's what, we, that's what we called them mks and pk you know like this like we were all yeah yeah i was a tk you know teacher's kid it was um maybe it was maybe it was just a steinbach thing my <laughs> i think yeah we didn't have that cool lingo like that was so cool. oh my god it should come back it was so cool <laughs> 
So, so yeah, so fight night is like sort of the um, most recent chapter. Uh, in, yeah. Yeah. In, in this sort of ongoing, you know, I, I see it sort of being in line, particularly with all my puny sorrows and then um, the book I never remember the name of Complicated Kindness, yeah. right? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. this trio. This yeah. Um, yeah. And so I'm wondering, what, what, did, what did you specifically, I mean, I have my ideas, of course, about what you're specifically taking up, like what part of the sort of um, Mennonite experience, mm -hmm. um, what are we looking at that's sort of different in this book? Or what did you want to look at in this book that was, you know, an evolution of those other books? Obviously, mm -hmm. when I started reading this, I was like, oh, you just wrote women talking. This is women yelling. I yeah. love it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but also about, you know, there's a lot of light and fire in this mm -hmm. book and a lot of I mean, it's really about, you know, what is this fight that these women are talking about? What are they fighting? Mm -hmm. What does the fight entail? I mean, it seems like this, this saga is, is interested in like survival, mm -hmm. yeah. and joy, um, yeah. joy and tragedy. Um, yeah. So maybe you can just talk a little bit about maybe like thematically, like Mm -hmm. or artistically what you were interested in this saga um, as opposed to the other sort of sagas in this same story. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, it is, a you know, the fight the fight for survival, like you say. And I think those, you know, those those themes that I've kind of not just touched on, but really examined, I guess, um, in my in my other stuff, you know, um, you know, patriarchal, authoritarian, fundamentalist religion, you know, the Mennonite, i.e. the, you know, the, the Mennonite community that I grew up in, um, missing, missing fathers, mental illness, suicide, um, um, illness. I mean, it's, um, I think all, all of, all of those, all of those things are kind of touched on or well, more than touched on. What's the other word between touched and something else, you know, dealt with. Yeah. Deeply examined. Yeah. yeah. Deep. Well, yeah. Deeply examined. <laughs> Maybe not so deeply examined as other books, but they're there. It's sort of like they provide this kind of, um, you know, resounding in a way back backdrop to the lives of Swiv and her mom and her grandma, and um, and those are some of the things that they're that they're up against that that they're fighting. Uh, those are some of the things, some of the battles that they've lost. You know, but essentially, it's true. It is you know the fight. The fight is for for survival and 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 whatever that means. You know, whatever that means to these these particular girls and women at the at their you know at this point in their, at this point in their lives. And Swiv is you know, she's very troubled. Uh, she's, she's anxious. She's, you know, she pretends to be a lot tougher than she really is. She's vulnerable. She's afraid. She's really afraid of her mother, um, uh, of her mother going, going crazy of her mother succumbing to the illness that, you know, that, that killed her or that resulted in the suicides of, um, you know, of her aunt and her grandfather. And, uh, you know, she's, she's, she's so so when i was writing it i was thinking okay i was thinking okay yeah the the, the idea of um you know that just the horror of that uh like genetic madness of feeling that maybe you've inherited the fear that the fear of that the dread maybe maybe you know will i have inherited this um you know that this illness will i have will it you know will it get me has it has it already i mean you know i worry about my kids my grandchildren and again, when my grand, I, I started having grandchildren and, and, um, and I wanted to write something for them. I mean, obviously it's something that would resonate with other people too, but, and in my mind, I kept thinking, okay, you know, here are these grandchildren, here are these beautiful human beings. So joyful. It's wonderful. Here they are. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's the best thing in the world. And yet I kept thinking, well, you know, they're going to, they're going to get older. I mean, this world. Yeah. Now, everything that their family has experienced that you know they're going to ask questions who who are these people that i was named after you know what happened to them where are they what's going on you know <laughs> i wanted to i wanted to somehow write something that would kind of you know have swiv you know like ask those questions and wonder those things and and somehow you know that it would that it would make you know people laugh and that it would be kind of 
hopeful, um, you know, something that would resonate with joy, as as you said, but also, you know, not not to not to shy away from from all of those dark and difficult times. Yeah, and okay, now I have two more questions. Yeah. So, um, sorry, I'm first, so rambly. I'm just rambling. No, on. you're perfect. You're perfect. No. Uh, <laughs> not, not, um, not perfect. The so one is just about Swiv and her as a character, as a construct, as a voice. Because mm -hmm. I think the one thing I, I mean, I admire so much about your writing, but one thing is just um, also in a complicated kindness when you had an adolescent narrator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, your ability to capture the adolescent and pre adolescent consciousness. Like, I am just back there and I remember what it's like to be that age. And so, mm -hmm. and I think that's such a talent to be able to do that. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, what your, pro what your process is. I mean, if it, if it even is yeah. a process or like, if you're just very much in touch with that self, with that adolescent self within you and that mm -hmm. adolescent voice or how, mm -hmm. how you sort of create that, mm -hmm. um, and then I'll ask you another question about tragedy and joy. <laughs> if I don't ramble on too long, <laughs> no. you know, time to ask another question. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just something, I, re I remember when I was writing the character of Nomi Nickel, the 16 year old in A Complicated Kindness. And I had always felt as though I was sort of enter, it wasn't like, I wasn't writing about her, I was her. Yeah, I was, I was that's how it feels when you read it. Yeah, yeah, and that's so it's sort of like playing a role, you know, in in a sense, like acting, not not writing, just acting and playing this role. And I set the book intentionally in nineteen uh, eighty when I myself was sixteen. Right. Okay, that's you know, there's that information, and um, and I also set it in a place that I was familiar with, and so you know, and I knew that 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 you know, the, the references, the popular cultural references, for instance, pop cultural references and, and, and everything, you know, could be accurate. I would just remember them. And, and so, and, you know, and I wouldn't have to do a lot of research. <laughs> so that same time, but, but, and it was the same, it was the same thing with, um, with Swiv and actually just a little, you know, Swiv is the, Swiv, 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 the, the Swiv is short for swivel head. And that, that's the nickname that my own sister gave me when I was a kid, my late sister. Um, she uh, was six years older than me. And, you know, because I was always wondering like, what the hell is going on around <laughs> here? And so, you know. and so, and actually Nomi Nickel in A Complicated Kindness, is, that's her nickname as well. And so I decided to just kind of whoop, transfer that to this book as well and call Swift Swift. Um, but the nine-year-old and both those ages, I think nine and 16, um, but you know, we'll say nine because that's what we're talking about. Nine-year-old Swift. It's just that cuspy feeling. I just think, and I just think that feeling between, you know, that, that innocence of, of childhood and the sort of, um, I mean, kids know a lot, obviously, but you know, they don't, you know, but, but, and then, and then the, you know, just sort of like on the cusp of entering puberty, mm. but still being a kid. And I just, and I find that, and then it, with adolescence as well, you know, between, between adolescence and, and, and becoming an adult. And I just find those in between times so rich in terms of, um, you know, storytelling potential, because there's so much, like, there's so much clashing, right? Yes. You know, so, and, and um, so many questions, so much confusion and, and they're like trying to claim so much, but at the same time, they know so little. So there's this yeah. constant like reaching out, but just like not having the ability to to process, not having yeah. enough information yet. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And there's that kind of literalness too with Swiv, you know, like a kind of literal interpretation of what's going on, but then also not, you know, because I mean, she'll, she'll be sarcastic and she'll, you know, so there's a lot of comic exaggeration in her descriptions of her mom, for instance, who, you know, she's just, you know, continuously exasperated by yeah. and, um, you know, but, but yeah. And then, you know, her kind of the wisdom of innocence, in a sense, meeting uh, the, the wisdom of experience and her grandmother, you know, and how those, those worlds come together. And then the mother is just sort of, you know, kind of, in the real world in a way, I mean, or however you want to, I mean, obviously Swiv and grandma are also in the real world, but the mother is, you know, pragmatically attempting to, you know, make a living. Pay she gets to leave the house though and then come back. I mean, there is a sense that she's like on her little side journeys <laughs> while like Swiv and grandma are like on the hero's journey, you know? Like. Yeah. Yeah. Literally like they're always on the move. You know? Right. Yeah. And 
Yeah, I'm just realizing that, that, I mean, that's another one of the brilliant things about your books is that they, they, they have all of these constant tension. Like there's so many contradictions and tensions um, yeah. on so many levels. Uh, and I'm glad you brought up humor. I mean, humor. Yeah, she's hilarious. The, the book is hilarious. She says, I don't laugh out loud in books, at books, and I do not cry at books, except Miriam Taves' books. She's uh, the only books that have made me cry. Um, and so, yeah, I'm wondering how you think about, you know, because there's a lot of humor, and I'm also very interested in anger, and I think yeah. there's a lot of anger, yeah. too, and how how you're sort of dealing um, and using, using those mm -hmm. um, with these characters and within this book, because I don't think humor and anger are, are necessarily opposites. Right. Um, yeah. But yeah. I, maybe we're talking I mean, a bit about that. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're inextricably entwined, I think humor mm -hmm. and anger and, and all of the, you know, the various feelings that we have or the ways that we look at the world or the things that we carry with us inside of us. Um, and also the way that we tell stories, you know, the part of our, our tool, box yeah. <laughs> it's a kind of modern way of <laughs> how people refer to it you know our toolboxes and you know the things that we that we use to just to um to show character to create voice to um to you know penetrate the soul of <laughs> you know, to find out what's going you know to, to know what's going on and the humor thing is just i think i mean it's not so much a conscious it's, 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 again, it has to do with, you know, as you know, you know, the, 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 the way you see the world, you know, right. and, and, and um, that it's a funny place, you know, <laughs> what does Lou Reed say? You know, the city is a funny place. Yeah. I mean, it very I, much I, seems like, sewer, you know, yeah, play. it seems like an emergent quality of you as a person. And then yeah. you as, as the writer of this character, you know, it's just like, can't help but emanate from your spirit yeah but 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 also too you know you're right i mean the anger the rage um you know and particularly that's ve that very specific female rage um you know there's a lot that you know that each of each of the the women and girl in in my story it, you know there's a there's a lot of rage in all of them mm -hmm. um, for very specific reasons and you know and again then you know the, the story becomes a little bit too of how of how they of how they deal with that how they live with that because i mean you know that it's a it's a horrible thing to to carry rage around in oneself and as Mennonites I mean you know we're so discouraged I mean you know anger is a sin you know so there's yeah. like, just so how are we supposed to even first of all acknowledge this and then you know express it and and get rid of it somehow you know and, and um so it's yeah so definitely it, that is a that is it that is a huge part of it in spite of its kind of comic you know right right here I mean, but what a gift, what a gift to be able to read a book and see three very different women, females, um, from uh, three very different worlds, mm -hmm. three, you know, three generations mm -hmm. who are angry mm -hmm. and loud mm -hmm. and taking up space and messy. Yeah. very. Um, and like, there's no man, there's no man. Yeah. And they are making a messy, loud life on their own terms. I mean, like, that's the sort, that's why your books make me cry. Cause I'm like, finally, like, I, like, it's a story that feels as, as like necessary. These characters feel as necessary as like food to me. It's like, thank you for, for giving us. Um, You're going to make me cry. <laughs> Because it just feels so good to have that, to have that kind of understanding of my work articulated. I mean, you know, I really, I really, really appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I feel you, Miriam. I do. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I have so many more questions, but I, but we're also so maybe we can intermingle them with some that that the folks um, are asked, the audience is asking, so we both don't start crying. I think that would be a good idea. Probably. Let's avoid that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, this is a great a great question, answerable question. Okay, phew. Yeah, is there anything that was edited out of Fight Night that you still think about? That, oh yeah, I will tell you. <laughs> and again, you know, it's not a, <laughs> probably, you know, probably my editor was, I, I love my editor and, you know, I, I don't know what I would do 
do without her. I mean, you know, as you know, a good editor is, is everything, you know, saving us from ourselves basically. And, um, but there, there were just a few kind of really gross details um, that, you know, <laughs> thought oh maybe you know like the idea of you know babies shitting black tar you know that like maybe I said that too often I'm not sure, but things like that having to do with you know bodily functions and stuff like that that yeah. you know that I just thought well swim I mean she's nine she's so horrified by everything having to do with the body of course and and um you know including sex and and it's so funny I thought when grandma and mom you know kind of start you know, get, sure. getting, yeah. getting into it. And I, and, and um, so it's not like I really, it's not like I regret that not being there. I, it was probably a good idea, but that it was, that was like, yeah. <laughs> Follow up question. Um, I love the passages where Elvira's, I think they're mostly Elvira's where she's like stretching to explain, like telling the story of the mom and then, um, stretching to explain, talking about fighting and, you know, really like goes for it and all those ellipses yeah. um, and just how that so perfectly, you know, communicates like how she's talking and, and what she, how she's struggling to like bring what she wants to say into words. Mm -hmm. And I'm assuming were those parts just sort of written and not touched too much in really? the editing process. Yeah, that's really true. I mean, it was almost like a stream of consciousness yeah. thing. It reads that way, of course, but in a, you know, and Swiv is recording grandma and, um, and, and, and grandma is realizing that, you know, Swiv is, is suffering. Swiv is like, mm -hmm. she's having a nervous breakdown. I mean, again, you know, that's, um, but she's, she's panicking, she's freaking out and it's because she doesn't know what's happening and she's terrified. She's terrified mm -hmm. of losing her mother. She's terrified. Of, and so grandma realizes this. At the, at, at, in this moment and realizes that what Swiv really needs is to be told the truth. She's such a good grandma. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, she's yeah. such a bad grandma too. Yeah, she's right. Both. <laughs> and, you know, and, and, um, and so, you know, so they're, they're grounded on the plane. The plane can't take off for mechanical reasons, which of course, you know, Swiv is terrified about. That's another reason for her to worry. Whereas grandma's like, yeah, whatever, don't worry what happens. And, <laughs> and, um, and she takes that opportunity, right. To tell this, this story, the true thing about what happened, this terrible thing and how, yeah you know, to, to Swift's mother and, um, and what happened to her as a result and, you know, the breakdown and everything. And that's where the title comes from during that sort of monologue of, mm -hmm. of grandma's. And when she finally <clears throat> tells the truth, you know, and she's finished and she's told the story, you know, the, the plane can then, you know, take off, right. There's, there's liftoff and lightness and, yeah. and they can, and they can go, you know, which is, you know, obviously then, you know, then Swift's spirit and her soul and her heart can also be open and free and can fly. <laughs> That's, I'm sorry. It sounds so cheesy, but no, what? it's beautiful. It's perfect. Um, speaking of like thing, you know, symmetries and uh, plotting, mm -hmm. um, I won't say what happens in the end, but did you, was the end sort of plotted out? Was that, or, or did you sort of arrive there and see what needed to happen? Because I think it's so wonderfully um, handled and executed. I, I, I did, I did just think for a tiny little bit about having an alternate alternate oh, wow. <laughs> um, and ending just yeah. a, just a really, really, tiny part of it but because part of it again was that you know in my mind I was writing this book for my grandchildren right it's not a kid's book but for you know for my grandchildren to read hopefully if they're interested when they're older you know and and um and others but but you know which goes without saying but but it's but um I sort of had them in in mind and and um and I just felt like no I I mean I can't hold back I wanted you know I had this I had this thing as a grandmother right that I wanted to convey certain information you know <laughs> and these types of things happen yeah. and we can survive them you can survive them you will be okay you know the world is a dangerous dark place but you will be okay and you know but you need to know you need to know what you're yes. what you're up against right? right and so you know so then so then I kind of knew how I, how, how of it was. I mean, it had to, end, it had to end the, the way it ended. It was, it's, it's gorgeous. Um, another, another question, the cover of Fight Night mm -hmm. feels incredibly unique. 
Mm. Did you have a hand in choosing the design? And I'm guessing they're um, mm -hmm. referring to this. So there's also, and I don't know if this is the final. I, 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 I have one of every Miriam Taze book from every country I can find. <laughs> that's, that's really but these are the gorgeous. Um, that's the Canadian and then the, and then the American and and I really like them both. When I, I saw the I saw the um, the American version, the, the yeah the white one um, first before I before I saw the Canadian and and um, Bloomsbury when they when they said <laughs> exactly there were a few variations on that they sent a few yeah. variations on that and I just loved that kids one so much <laughs> you know it's that really is, good I like that is that swim you know look at those eyes like Wah! and <laughs> yeah, like what the and you know. This yeah. hand, I can't. I'm backwards, so I can't. But we have yeah. Our, like, yeah, yeah. And I, and as soon as they sent it to me, I I was so thrilled with it. I thought I just loved it, you know. And that that has rarely happened to me. And um, you know, the covers are hard. Covers yeah. are so hard. Yeah, and you know they're always kind of not right. And yeah, I just loved it from the get go. That's excellent. Yeah, I mean, there it's it's perfect. It's a great drawing. Okay. Um, let me see there. Was there ever a point in writing Fight Night that you had a hard time connecting with one of the characters? Hmm. Um, or maybe a bugaboo of a, we could extend that even to like, was there like a bugaboo of a plot, you know, like ever right. a place where you kind of got stuck or tripped up? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think, I, I don't remember really feeling that it was difficult to connect to the characters basically because they were all, you know, kind of, sort of familiar to me um but but um and you know based on real people but but um but it, but i feel that um certainly like at the at the beginning i did think yeah in terms of plot i mean i'm, I'm so bad at plots you know one time i'll just say this one time i got it as a this rejection from a publisher in, in the uk you know and yeah. this, well we'd you know we we love this book you know save for its fatal lack of plot <laughs> you know? so they you know they, they passed on it but i always thought that was so brilliant i i thought oh i should i should actually use that as a blurb yeah know? right as i mean i don't know i mean plots are good and useful but i just don't know how to do them very well anyway so i so again i was of course confronted with my own shortcomings and the plot the, the plot for what there is i mean it's just about you know these the you know women and you know these females living together for a few weeks and you know and what and what that's all about and and uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm not really selling my what book. What a description! I'm not my book. It's a, and 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 uh, but that was something that I, I again I should probably be at the point in my life maybe I don't know what what that, what point that is but where I can say okay this is just how I write fair enough you know it's what I, it's what I do but I still though you know I'm sort of like oh god I should have the things should just sort of there should be a plot or there should be you know more of this something connected to another thing you know rather than these kind of yeah so i did i did struggle with that and i always struggle with that and i'm all and i always come to the same conclusion you know in which i, I realize that i can't do it any other way but i should just know that you know before i go go into it rather than yeah I, that's really good to hear though because i mean I did get to, there was a point in the book where I'm like, oh, so many things are happening. Like, oh, wow. yeah, well, this is amazing. Um, I also like don't understand plot or even, I mean, do I believe in, yeah, I guess I, I do believe in plot, but, but there's also a sense that this book is, um, you know, there's like a manifesto sort of mm -hmm. spirit to it. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it has other things that needs to get done other than mm -hmm. plot, you know, yeah. like, and. And you can, I, someone was tweeting, like, you, as long as you're, you can get away with a lot, with no plot, as long as your style is mm -hmm. impeccable. And mm -hmm. I think that's actually really true. Like, if you have a style, mm -hmm. and if you are doing something interesting, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. then, then maybe we just think about plot later. And, um, I, or if at all. And, <laughs> if ever. and I mean, it, it's, it's a very, you know, like what do they call that character driven or voice it's a voice driven you know yes piece of swiv of course was is is everything and that was the biggest the biggest biggest challenge for sure was to to you know to make sure that i struck the right tone with her voice and yes 
And we're with Swiv no matter what. I mean, like you have us from the first, you know, the opening, the opening lines. Um, I'm going to take this question just because my mom wrote it. Oh, yes, right on. <laughs> from Linda Yoder, and it's very provocative. Um, hey. Have either of you considered moving back and forth in two worlds, mainstream American narrative and Mennonite world, being socially savvy, maybe a resident alien? Hmm. I, I don't know if that means like in our work or um, in our real lives. But have you ever like considered trying to to live in two worlds, or if you could, is that is that something that um, is appealing? Mm -hmm. You mean like in 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 writing and in, in? I mean, I know I, I I understand the question. It's such a good question. It's so layered. I think that I mean this idea. I I'm obsessed with the idea actually of of worlds and of you know layers of worlds colliding of the you know the intersection of various worlds that we that we do seem to be living in all the the time you know on a sort of um surface level we're moving from you know world world to world to world, sure. to world. but even in our in our minds and in our i mean i thought that by the time i i had reached the age that i have reached that i would be sure of the world that i was living in you know not necessarily the physical world around me i mean i'm planet earth but i mean the the the, the world in my head like my inner life my oh inner gosh it gets more complicated doesn't it, it? Gets more complicated and then it becomes again going back you know call back to the shame thing you know this this idea of like well who why why haven't i figured this out you know why am i the only one who hasn't figured out who I am. I mean, you know, this is the territory of adolescence, isn't it? I'm so old now and I'm still trying to figure out who I am and what world I belong in or what world I want to create or what world I want to, you know, inhabit mentally sort of and, and yeah. you know, soulfully. Yeah, that's a good, it's a good question. It is a good question. And I've been thinking a, a lot about like the word possession um, and and also what a haunting is, whether haunting, mm -hmm. being haunted, what that means, um, yeah. is a haunting something that you sort of do to yourself um, or can it be something you do to yourself as I'm, as I'm entering into these questions too, because that's the same sense I have that like, um, I mean, my father always said this line to me, like, you'll always be who you are which is like sort of like a curse and sort of like wisdom. Um, yeah, exactly. And, and so just thinking about, Oh okay, yeah, I, I will always be who I am. And that's a, com that's a complicated thing with these like worlds that flow into and out of each other um, very fluidly um, in, in, in my mind and in, in and in my work and like yeah. trying to like find a, Liter trying to find a form um, on the page that can capture that is um, interesting to work. And I think that's, you know, what you're also. Yeah, having. it is. It's so interesting to work because, you know, on the one hand, I mean, you know, something like that, I'm, you know, my father actually said a similar thing to me, you know, really the only piece of um, advice he ever gave me was, was uh, he, he said, and it sounds so patent like a cliche, but he said, be yourself. Um, be, so loaded. <laughs> I know. Be yourself. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and so you know, similar thing. Well, okay, but you know, how, who, what, um, and and um, and and why did you think I was being somebody else? Like by saying something or by behaving in a certain way, am I being somebody else, or am I just being a very a different, you know, var variation on the theme of right. myself? You know, different. But yeah, but then when it comes to writing, I mean, how confined are we, right? You know, I'm, I'm curious too to know how you feel about that when we start writing, just, you know, to start writing to somehow get into that because we can only get into ourselves if we're, if we're going to write, you know, we can't do it any other way. Mm -hmm. you know, so when we're, un so yeah, it, just so to, to, for that to happen is almost a kind of alchemy or something. I don't know how 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 do we get into ourselves? Like alchemy is a really good word. I mean, I've I've heard you say in in interviews that when you write, that's like all you're doing. You like go into your writing, um, and that that was my experience of that's my experience too. Is that 
a night bitch more so than other stuff I've done, but there's this, this experience of sort of channeling yeah, um, of going into something uh, very deeply. And it's, yes, it's like an artistic act, but it's also a very um, psychological sort of um, experiment. It's a, it's a spiritual yeah. Um, undertaking. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess, I, I'm wondering about like ch channeling as process and, and what that means for, for the work that comes out. I mean, I don't really know, even know what to say about that, but. Um, oh, that's such a good word channeling. I mean, that, that's what it is, you know, and how do you stay open to, how do you be yourself and, you know, connect with yourself, whatever that is, you know, and keep yourself, yourself open to, you know, <laughs> other voices other to channel. I don't know. <laughs> And it's, yeah, and it's like, it's, it's, I mean, it's almost physical where I, 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 especially my early writing, when I started writing when I was 20, I described it as physical work. Like I would sit down at a desk and like, get it out of me. Yeah. And I have heard you two talk about, you have to get this thing out of your body. Yeah. Um, and like, what is, what is this thing we're possessed of that we yeah. need to like, have it exit our body um yeah i mean it means we're writers it's <laughs> it's everything 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 that we see feel experience you know think comes into us and you know forms a type of sickness that we <laughs> expel <laughs> and in its expulsion we need to make it less sick looking <laughs> Right. To, to order it, to order it. Um, and to order it and to craft some narrative from it. Yeah. But I don't know how that happens, actually. Um, yeah, we we don't know. Well, okay. I have an, a non-metaphysical um, alchemic question here. So Kristen asks, so much of your fiction builds off of your own life experiences. Why choose to write your novels as fiction and not creative nonfiction? Good old genre question. Yeah. And again, you know, I've grappled with that too. I think um, so, so many books that I've written um, have, I'm not sure fight night so much. I think I was quite sure that it, that, that it would, that it would be fiction, but, um, but, but there are other books where I have thought, yeah, you know, it's so close. It's so autobiographical and why not? Um, I mean, I love reading nonfiction. I love reading about, you know, women's lives, women's real lives, you know, writers and, and whatever. I mean, I read, I read a lot of nonfiction and I, um, there's something, I guess, freeing, freeing, I think for me to write, to write fiction, because then that allows, you know, the possibility of making things up. And, um, and, and, um, and so, so I, I think that's the, and, and the, um, I mean, not nonfiction is just as artful an expression, obviously, and just as crafted as fiction. It's not. It's not that, but I think it's. It's just the. Um, so that, that that's not the difference. I think really the the difference is, um, you know, and the quality of the writing, obviously, is this. It, it's just the, and the sentences and and all of that. Like it's all, it's all the same except that with with fiction and if you call something fiction and again these terms fiction nonfiction, you know whatever i mean can be sort of um par paralyzing in a way too if we yeah. think about it too much and you know as opposed to just start and then it becomes what it becomes but but it's um yeah i think it's the freedom that fiction that writing fiction gives gives me that i that i want to yeah i think too that when you're working with material that is so emotionally charged that there's also a psychological distance that fiction yeah. affords, right? Where you can yeah. take a character and it's not really your sister, you know, yeah. someone like your sister and it makes yeah. that that's easier yeah. to maybe work with. Um, that's, that's a, yeah, that's so true. You know, it does, it does it's a, it's a little buffer, you know, uh, like a little, armor in a mm -hmm. sense obviously you're attempting really 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 to get deep into to characters and the story and the honesty of it and the truth of it but um but if you're yeah yeah it's a buffer zone um stephanie i don't know if we have if we, i'm like can, we, can i ask her all the rest of these questions they're really good but tell me what to do tell us what to do <laughs> is there a question that you didn't get to ask that you are like please stephanie let me ask this 
question. Well, I do think it's fun. I do think the whole fact that women talking is turning into a movie is going to be a movie is really exciting. And someone had, I love, you know, like just an exciting, what parts of turning women talking into a movie did you get to be a part of and experience, which I think is like a fun. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it is, it is exciting as is yours being turned into a movie. It's, um, it's kind of a thing. It's sort of like, okay, it's hard to know what to, what to think about it because, you know, um, in, in, in the case of women talking, it's, um, Sarah Polly is the writer she wrote. She adapted the the book and, and directed it. And, you know, in so many ways, I mean, it's her, it's her movie. I mean, in every way it's her movie, um, you know, and the actors and, and, um, but I got to meet the actors and, and, and of course I know Sarah, um, and we talked a, a lot, um, you know, sort of throughout. She would have different questions, and and um, I went to the set and and checked it out. And everything was just sort of wild, and and you know, you, you just think. Um, and I mean, I think it's going to be. I know it's going to be amazing. I saw the actors at work. I realized how hard actors work. I mean, it's just phenomenal what they were able to do in this, you know, tight setting, you know, all these, you know, 10, seven, eight people, you know, having to go over the same scene with a 10 minute take, which is forever, like a lifetime, you know, and they, and so over and 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 you know, <laughs> different angles. Well, I'm talking about obviously, <laughs> yes, we know Miriam and <laughs> many takes, but, it, but um, yeah. And then, I don't know, just in the, the attention to detail, you know, with the sets uh, was just really mind blowing. And again, Rachel, I'm sure you think too, you're just sitting, you know, you're just sitting in a little room, maybe in a large room and um, writing a book, you know, the story that you hope will resonate with some people. And um, and it's just, that's what it is, you know, it's, it's a book and, and uh, to see it sort of take sh this other shape is, is a very, it's a very strange uh, process for sure. Yeah, agree. Yeah. <laughs> And it just gets stranger and stranger. Well, you just have to like let it go because, like yeah. you said, it's like not your movie. It's it's something else now. I mean, yeah. and even when you publish a book, it's it's kind of yeah. not your book anymore. It's just exactly. a thing that, and all these people are having this experience with it. And um, yeah. yeah, there's something very like the, I find it a relief to be Absolutely. like. There yeah, it it's over. It's done. I mean, you know, the work, we did the work and, um, you know, and hopefully, you know, that that did something good for us. And, um, and, and, and then it's time to move on. And, and, um, and it's lovely thinking, you know, that here's this thing out there, you know, that, you know, affecting different people in different ways, and will you be used to maybe to become a, a musical or <laughs> Uh, you know, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. Women singing. A circus. I mean, it's yeah. timed. Come yeah. on. Like Mennonite hymns. Yeah. Women talking the musical needs to happen. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be great? It would be beautiful. Yes. It'd be amazing. Yeah. I bet Sarah Polly could do that one too. Yeah. <laughs> I am not joking. I'm so into that. I wish <laughs> someone you could do it. Do it. Miriam's yeah. people. Get in touch with Miriam's people. We're making exactly. women talking the musical happen. <laughs> You heard it here first. It was decided tonight. Uh, welcome to those watching. Congrats. You're in on the the, um, <laughs> the big announcement. Yeah. Uh, oh, my gosh. I just want to highlight for both of you because this definitely. Well, first of all, I want to say we were talking about this a little bit in the background of like, we all wish we could be doing virtual events. Uh, or sorry. We are doing virtual events. We all wish we could be doing in-person events. Um, but virtual events are so cool because we get to see authors who might not typically be in conversation together, actually talking together. Um, and you two have been so fun. I am. I wish you could have seen my face when I was like, when you said PK, because I was a PK also. Oh. And we used that language. So you are not alone. I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't used that in like a couple of years, but I am from a community where we very much had one of my best friends was PK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Sarah um, was kind enough to leave this comment. And I just think you both should see it because your conversation. Um, <laughs> should not be shocking given um, both of the books that you oh, and you've written many books, but both of these books, um, you both are so adept at using humor as, as an overlay onto really like difficult, uh, tough 
storylines, I guess is, is what I would say. And that felt like this conversation felt like it reflected that. Like there was so much depth to the conversation between both of you, but also constant humor throughout it. Um, I definitely had a lot of smiles on my face and Rachel, like you were saying, you don't cry or laugh out loud during books a lot. And like, I will be honest, there's not that many interviews where I'm in the background, like, oh my gosh, thank goodness I'm on mute. I was just like, <laughs> I myself, I started laughing out loud. So um, this has been incredible. Really, really quickly, if we have time, um, I made some themed this or that questions for both of you um, that are ending on our note of humor. I promise, Rachel, I see your face. You're, so great. You're gonna be amazing. Right. <clears throat> I'm um, ready. I'm ready. And you can say neither, but the rule is if you say neither, you have to provide an alternate alternate answer. Okay. So you don't have to choose one of these two, but you have to provide a different answer if you so choose. Um, and they are themed to the fact that like it is October. It is almost mid-October. I don't know how that happened. So like we're we're getting into Halloween season, right? So first of all, are you fall or winter people? Is this Fall. I'd say fall. Do we just jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Just shout it out. Just fall. Okay. Fall. Definitely. That's the right answer. I mean, who likes winter? <laughs> like, really? I don't know. I mean, I'm from Winnipeg, so. I will winter a lot. It's really long, too. Yeah. Winnipeg, I'm sure Winnipeg's even worse, but yeah. It's yeah. tough. Oh, yeah. Nice. And dark. So dark. Uh, yeah. So very dark. <laughs> um, okay. Pumpkin spice lattes. You have them in Canada, right, Miriam? No, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I'm kidding. We do. I was like, stop it. <laughs> um, pumpkin spice lattes or mold wine? Wine. I mean, <laughs> can I do like a matcha latte? I'll accept that alternate answer. Okay, I mean that, but yeah, mold wine is great too. But did you say matcha? Matcha, like the matcha. green matcha. Oh, oh yeah. matcho. I would take a matcho latte. <laughs> latte. Just a rock. Arr, like big, big, big giant thing. Yeah, it's like 87 ounces. Yeah. Like okay. It's black and, you know, <laughs> like green and, you know, kind of has like spikes on it. Yes. Yeah. I am, um, I, yeah. We do have all of that in Canada too. <laughs> You're about to blow my mind that Starbucks like hadn't brought a PSL to Canada. And I was going to be like, what is that world like? Because it just is so infective. Um, the United States. I, I, I'm going to try one actually. Yeah. <laughs> Pumpkin spice latte. I wish I wasn't as basic as I am and I do love them deeply. Like they come out in like August now in St. Louis and I had a nice pumpkin spice latte the first day it came out because I just, <laughs> probably because I'm trying to like get to the fall because. Right. You want to be here. Yeah. Yeah. Just 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 to yeah. 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 Um, okay, Frankenstein or Dracula? And that can be up to interpretation if we're talking like movie interpretation, book interpretation, whatever you so desire. Oh, they're both really good. Yeah. I'm gonna say I'm gonna say um Frankenstein just because, you know, I'm a I'm a big Mary Shelley fan and uh and and, and of her mother as well, Mary Wollstonecraft, and you know that that those generations of brilliant um women writers um and what Frankenstein represents, the you know uh society being monstrous etc and what what it makes of us and what it turns us into so i like i but dracula is an amazing book as well um at character and concept <laughs> i'm going i'm going with dracula because of van because or vampires in general because i have the same coloring as vampires and um <laughs> That's my full answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is maybe the best answer. <laughs> yeah. um, because I am I almost a vampire them. is basically my answer. Um, Miriam, this is making me think, oh my gosh, why can't I come up with it? Do you know about the book that came out recently that is, it, it's fiction, but it's like, um, oh, I can picture the cover of it because it's beautiful. Um, it's fiction, but it is the... <sighs> Eight days between Mary Shelley, or sorry, Mary Wollstonecraft giving birth to Mary Shelley and dying, and it's like what the eight. It's like a, a speculation, oh. like what those eight days were. Do you know about this book? I don't think I do, but that does sound really good. I'd like to check it out. I'll figure out the title. It's like yeah. perfect. It's like if you're a Mary Shelley, like Mary Wollstonecraft fan, <laughs> as I am, like it is 
very important reading. I, I'll, we'll, we'll yeah. discuss. Yeah, I mean, I like, I also like, you know, Percy Bysshe, you know, the husband and son-in-law of these two, of these two women, but. Yeah, he's great. He's yeah. fine. Yeah, we, we can hear him on. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. But I would love to know that, yeah, what that book is called, for sure. Yeah. Um, apple pie or pumpkin pie? <laughs> Claire, Claire is coming in clutch. Love and Fury by Samantha Silva. That's oh, right on. oh, right on. Thank you. Love, love and Fury. Okay, good. Good. Thank you. I mean, Sorry. pumpkin Question. pie, if it's at the Yoder, Yoder Thanksgiving, pumpkin pie with Cool Whip that's partially, still partially frozen yeah. Yeah. is what I would pick. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because just at our little Canadian Thanksgiving thing the other day, ours is earlier, um, we had a, a pumpkin pie that I accidentally, you know, forgot to take out of the freezer. And, um, you know, and so we did have, it was kind of, it was frozen and, you know, didn't have Cool Whip on it. I made, I beat some cream, some whip with my um, three-year-old grandson. And I was sort of like, it was also was decorating the entire kitchen. <laughs> you know, um, festive. I'd say pumpkin pie too. I'm with you. Or well, I guess you had the both, right? Apple pie at different times or no, I'm, yeah, you, I mean, I'll eat an apple pie too. But <laughs> right, pie is pie. <laughs> I don't think the pumpkin. Yeah, sauce. tough showing for apple pie tonight. Really didn't take the cake, did it? <laughs> it got put under. Um, okay, final question. Um, zombies or witches? Oh, witches for sure. Yeah, I mean zombies can never die, right? I mean they live forever. That's that's. And you can't talk to them about anything. Like they don't have anything, you know, like interesting right. to say. <laughs> but witches, like, yeah. oh, they have be, stuff to say. You want to like hang out with them. Yeah. They've got stuff going on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I'm with you. Yeah. Witches. <laughs> well, um, thank you for entertaining our fall themed uh this or that. It's always fun to see authors talk about um it's great to see you talk about your books, but also it's fun to hear. Um, other opinions that you have in your life because you have many identities. Um, and thank you so much to everyone who um, joined us. I know we went late. I Everyone's still here watching because you all were so incredible, um, had such an engaging conversation. Um, before I let you say any final thoughts before you leave this evening, I just want to highlight Fight Night. We have signed copies. So if you're watching this and you're like, oh, I didn't buy my copy yet, we ha we got you. <laughs> you can purchase online. Um, we ship. Uh, we ship to Canada. We'll figure it out. It. We'll have to talk to us about it, but we definitely ship to Canada. Um, and we have signed copies available, like we said, um, which is actually. And I'm not just talking about signed book plates. I want to be clear. We have actual. It's hard, Rachel. You were trying to show the cover earlier. It's hard when you're like doing it. <laughs> but we have. Yeah. There, as I'm pointing the wrong thing, we have Miriam's signature. Um. So. Thank you both so much. Is there anything you want to say before we log off for the evening? I just want to say, Rachel, it was just amazing talking with you and such an honor. And um, and I love your writing and your work. And just thank you for just this wonderful conversation. Thank you so much. And thank you, Stephanie, for hosting this event. It was just brilliant. And thanks to everybody for tuning in. And, and um, yeah, it's just it, it feels really good to um to kind of meet people <laughs> <laughs> yes likewise and i i think i read somewhere that you said that you wanted to write you know stories of hope for mennonite girls and women mm -hmm. and you absolutely have you know i've been reading your books for years and um i yeah i feel like i've finally sh showed up somewhere you know and like i wasn't so alone so um wow. Thank you so much for the, I mean, for dedicating your life to this. It's like exactly what you should be doing. So. Oh, thank, thank you for saying that. Thank you. We'll, we'll meet, 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 meet. There's, there's a lot to this. <laughs> Yeah. You all are going to make us end on crying. They're here. <laughs> They're coming back. Rachel, you almost had them earlier. And I think we're, this is a um, quick shout out. I just want you guys to know, to see Claire is thanking you. Uh, <laughs> Rachel, there's some. Oh, Jana, she was like my best friend on the Mennonite commune when I was eight, and is a 
scholar, a Mennonite scholar now at Notre Dame, just like Amazing. a kick-ass human being. Um, hey, good. Jana. Hey, Jana. <laughs> <laughs> just wanted you all to see that. Thank you so much, everyone, for watching. And we will um, we'll be back here with great author events in the future. So we'll see everyone later. Bye. <laughs>